Don Sanchez Gold. By Thomas Kenny. The sun. It stung his eyes. It made his body lose its vigor. His pupils were squeezed by the unending burn of the light that surrounded him. The desert was unforgiving, and he knew that if he did not reach a body of water or a town, hell, even a damned tree, his days, or rather, hours, were numbered. Jody Black had only the clothes on his back, his pack, and his two firearms to his name. The rifle hugged between his shoulders, and his revolver caressed his thigh. His one remaining spur jingled as his torn boots kicked up the never-ending sand. He wobbled. He shook. He thought of nothing else but moving forward. Right. The man muttered to himself and struggled to whistle in order to maintain his sanity. The desert critters saw a man <coughs> whose eyes rolled drunkenly north and west, south and east. They knew soon, with a little patience, they could be the hosts of a great feast. But Jody had other plans, and he stumbled on. All that for this? Jody cried out. There was no echo, no assurance that he was not already dead. The desert stole all sound save for the blowing of the occasional sand and pebbles, and the clicks and hisses of critters. Jody was once an infamous outlaw known well across the many counties of Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada. Now he had turned his back on a life of crime, wishing to atone for his wrongdoings. But as far as he was concerned, the desert saw all that went on in its lands, and it was well aware that he had much to atone for. The desert had put him to the test. No more than eight or so hours prior, he had stumbled across a carriage as lost as he was. Inside were a mother and her child, the driver nowhere to be found. They had plenty of supplies, plenty of water, precious water. The mother was rifle-ready and adamant that he stay away. He could have taken everything they had, even their remaining horse, and the world would be none the wiser. But Jody Black had sworn an oath to never again harm the undeserving. However, he would be lying if he had not blurted his thoughts aloud of going back and finding that carriage once more. At least, he thought he spoke his thoughts aloud. He could not be sure. Two days prior, he had been the shotgun of a prison transport coach as part of his sentence. Now, he was lost somewhere on the border of empty and desert. He recalled being in the town of Maccabee near the border of Arizona and Nevada before they had departed for their destination. He would have been able to find his way back to town had he not needed to flee the firefight that he and his fellow travelers had found themselves in. Black had been in many a firefight, and he knew when the odds were hopeless, and that tussle was most certainly grim. Perhaps he was the only survivor, no way to know for sure. But at the back of his mind, he'd begun to wish he had fought it out to the end. Died a hero with true redemption in the hearts of the people. A heathen turned angel. Now it appeared he would die among the sand as any dog unwise enough to stray away from the beaten path. His bones would decorate the dead shrubs, and no one would be the wiser. Perhaps they would figure him a coward instead or a useless hired gun who was killed among the fray of bullets. Was he a coward? He began to wonder. Or was he wiser than the others for running off? They were all criminals as well, he began to justify his retreat, though he felt his heart ache even for those felons left to fend for themselves when the officers were killed. Black fought the thoughts of what could have been. Did it even matter now? Does anything matter once the end draws near? He halted his advance towards the plateau that was still many miles in the distance. The corner of his eyes had lied to him. He thought he had seen a ripe skeleton upon the ground which looked all too familiar. Black's eyes rolled to the right, and his head followed to find nothing but a bundle of rocks. He <laughs> coughed a laugh, and his monotonous facial expression went unchanged. The man managed to march on until the sun began to dip. Now he had a new fear, and an ironic one at that moment. The cold. It would bite his skin and make him sweat dryly. 
His pace quickened until the open air began to pull back on the reins of the heat. Before he realized, he had become too comfortable with the new temperature and collapsed forward into the dust below him. He woke suddenly and his head shot up roughly. He had turned over in his sleep. The stars were above and the crickets chirped. He made his body freeze in its place as he was overcome with the sensation that he was not alone. To his left, amongst the shrubs, something rustled. It was big, man-sized at least, perhaps bigger. Jody reached down for his revolver at his side. Every sound of fabric shifting as he did so made him tense up. He moved slower and slower with each scratch of his attire. To him, the sounds beat against his ears, disrupting the desert silence. He slowed his breath and kept his eyes on the shrubs just above the large rocks he had huddled against. The bundled man dared not peek over the top. His revolver slid gently from its holster, and he hugged it against his chest. The hammer clicked as he did his best to prime it quietly. The shrubs stopped rustling at the sound, and Jody stopped breathing. He could sense something eyeing the rocks just above him and beyond. It turned right and left. Then he heard a familiar sound, one that meant the jig was up. Growling. Deep. Growling. Jody saw the eyes first. They glowed green as the moon's light shone through them and back at him. Then he made out the figure amongst the grass as he began to stand. He grunted and coughed, and the grains of rock rained off his person. The wolf walked towards him, revealing its full form in the blue night. It eyed him and became silent. There was only one thing left for Jody to do. Stand his ground. The wolf turned its focus to the pistol that was finding its way into the man's hand. The white of the creature's teeth shone as it began to flare its nostrils. The beast hissed and growled. All right, then, Jody said. You made your point, friend. He slowly put the pistol back into its home and raised his hands before him. The man watched as the wolf could visibly be seen relaxing almost as soon as his weapon was put away. The oversized dog licked some of the dirt before him and chewed on some pebbles. It no longer cared that Jody was before him, and it continued to lick at different things below its feet. Jody backed away slowly until he was a good thirty yards away, and still the wolf ignored him, busying itself with the various intriguing smells on the ground. The wolf walked away lazily and disappeared into the grass. Jody continued walking until the morning began to crack and the heat returned. Once again, he grew weary and collapsed. He awoke, and several things happened rapidly. First, his left hand simultaneously felt numb, like it had been stabbed. Second, he heard growling and saw a blur of something whipping its head violently left and right at the edge of his vision. Thirdly, he began to regain his awareness and found that his hand had fallen near the mouth of a hole in the ground. To his side, the wolf he had encountered was whipping a rattlesnake violently between its jaws. Jody thought quickly and found that the snake had punctured his pinky and ring fingers. He began to suck at the holes and spit out the venom. His lips were already feeling slightly numb, and he knew he could not risk it, not in his state. He reached into his pack and pulled a hatchet from it. It all ended quickly. The wolf had laid down and was crunching upon the snake's head as Jody wrapped a cloth around his hand that now displayed two less extremities. He winced in pain, but he could only think of water now, and of food. He had to get moving. The wolf paused as Jody retrieved his fingers from the dirt. It licked its chops before returning to its meal. The desperado was desperate and degraded. He watched as his savior peeled flesh from bone quietly. Then he looked at the fingers in his hand and he thought for a while. A small price to have been paid. So far, he figured. Then he became hungry watching the wolf. His eyes began to cross as he spitlessly drooled. He licked to his fingers again. They were still warm. No! He shouted. The wolf's ears perked up 
and it cocked its head. I, I ain't like you, he pointed at the wolf. I'm a man. I ain't no dog. Jody hunched his shoulders as the sudden outcry spent a handful of energy. The beast before him looked around as though scanning the horizon for uninvited listeners before continuing its meal. Black held his severed ring finger, eyeing it before bringing it to his lip and biting it softly. He removed the appendage and shook his head before placing the fingers in his pocket. <sighs> Things ain't that desperate yet, damn you. Save them for if it does get that desperate, he said. Thank you, he said to the wolf. They made brief eye contact, and Black tipped his hat to the furry savior. The animal stood up with the last of its food dangling in the warm air. It approached the man and dropped the tail end of the snake and waited patiently. Jody was slow to understand, but eventually kneeled and retrieved the carcass. He had to eat. He took one massive chomp into the skin and began chewing. <sighs> He sighed in relief and drank some of the blood still trickling out of the innards. As far as he was concerned, it was better than his mama's cooking at that moment. He ate until he began to feel revulsion at the sight of his meal and tossed the remainder back to his unlikely companion. Then, with newfound energy, he continued walking. The wolf followed him, keeping pace a few dozen yards in the distance. Jody could spot him wandering off for a quarter of a mile at times, but the animal always came back and paralleled his path. The flatlands had become rocky, and boulders sat watching the two tiny wanderers. Jody began to think of water again, and he felt as though the heat was pulling his soul downward into the depths below the mortal earth. Butter! A voice shouted. It caught Jody off guard, and he did as he was told. Mostly out of exhaustion, and not because he wanted to. His arms tiredly raised above his head. From beneath a trap hole in the hillside appeared a man. His skin was dark, and his clothes were simple. In his hands, he held a long rifle. Barate ye! He shouted again. I am already, damn you! Jody said. Hablas inglés? The man shouted. Si, sí, amigo. No hablas espanol muy bien. Jody replied. ¿Qué es lo que quieres? The man asked. Water. Agua, uh, yo soy looking for, Jody said. Agua, si, si, déjame verte, the man said. Jody shuffled with dead feet towards the man. Ay, Dios mío, te ves como un cadáver, the man said. I feel like one, amigo, Jody replied. Look, I ain't looking for trouble. I've come far, and I've got farther still to go. Jody slowly removed his weapons and threw them on the ground before him. You, you, uh... No sabes dónde estás? The man asked. No, señor, Jody said. You a treasure hunter? The man asked. <laughs> Jody scoffed. What? He said to himself, shaking his head. No, I am not a treasure hunter, he answered. Why are you here if you no look for treasure? The man asked. Surviving, I suppose, Jody replied. Ven acá, the man instructed. Take uh, two pistolas, amigo. Lo vas a necesitar si estás buscando agua. The man finished. Jody hesitated, but did as the man instructed. He then climbed up the hill to meet with the stranger. The man was slumped down in a hastily dug-out trench. He was obviously Mexican, and surprisingly young, perhaps in his twenties, Jody reckoned. The young man held one hand below his gut and above his waist. Dark spots smothered the cloth there. You're looking pretty close to a corpse yourself, kid, Jody said. See. Si. I'm no bueno también, the young man replied. Jody looked around at the surroundings below the hill. At the center of a canyon, directly in the immediate sight line of the trench, were buildings. A dozen or more, he gathered. At least, that he could see at first glance. Down there. Treasure. Hay mucho oro, the young man said. What gold are you talking about? Jody asked. I ain't looking for any gold. I'm looking for water. The young man held up his round canteen. Jody stopped and felt his salivary glands struggling. Then, no más poquito. Yo lo necesito también, the young man said. What's your name, kid? Jody asked. Mateo. Tú? The young man responded. Well, thank you, Mateo. I am Jody. Just Jody. Jody answered. He received the canteen and fought with himself not to drink at all. 
He handed it back and sat beside Mateo, who was now leaning forward in the trench, binoculars eyeing the buildings in the canyon. Lo vi un lobo siguiendo. ¿Es tu amigo? Se parece a tu protector. Mateo said. I reckon he's just saving me for later. Damn mutt's just biding time. I know it. Jody replied. No, no, no. Sí, sí. Son muy inteligentes. Los indios tenían muchos. Y este tiene a ti. Mateo said. If you say so, amigo. Jody replied. You mentioned water. Where? Por allá. Mateo said, pointing. He handed the binoculars to Jody and guided his eyes to the buildings. Soldados. Soldiers? What are they doing out here? Jody asked. The treasure, amigo? Mateo laughed. <laughs> no sabes de la treasure? I don't even know where I am, let alone about no damn protected treasure, Jody said. The Santiago, Emmanuel, Oscar, Sanchez de la Cruz. He's been stealing muchos años. Mateo said. I've seen muchos treasure hunters como usted go there. Jody thought for a moment. The name Sanchez sounded familiar. Santiago? Ain't he been dead for 30 years or something? Jody asked. Maybe. Pero no su oro. Mateo laughed again. He grunted and winced, holding his gut. Si hay soldados, there are supplies, amigo. And that means agua, Jody said. Si, Mateo replied. You hold tight, Mateo, Jody said. I'm going to go nab us some water. Con cuidado, Jody. El hombre de Sanchez, muy malos, Mateo warned. Jody approached the small town. It was run down, dilapidated. It was obvious the original townsfolk had long abandoned it, and now it was a station for the crime lord Sancha's secret dealings. Water. And that's it. In and out, Joey. In and out. He spoke to himself. As he drew closer, he could make out figures standing on rooftops. They held long rifles and scanned the horizon. Jody knew it was foolish, but he knew he stood a better chance this way. He raised his hands high above his hat and approached. He could make out excited movements in the town, and voices calling to one another in Spanish. A bullet struck the dirt a yard before him, and then another. Soon there were enough guns ringing out that Jody was certain the courtesy warning shot had been skipped. He lunged behind a bundle of barrels and rocks. So much for diplomacy, he said, cocking his rifle. He aimed between two barrels and fired. The round hit a building wall far below the guard standing atop it. Jody cocked and fired again. The man reared to the side and fell off the roof into the dirt. Jody moved as to not allow the enemy to pin him down. Bullets whistled by, their impacts sending sprays of sand into the air. He placed himself against the wall of the building nearest the town entrance. He heard a voice calling from the roof of the building. He leaned forward, aiming his rifle upward. The soldier poked his head over the edge long enough for Jody to place a shot in his neck. The man screamed and fell to the ground a few feet away. Jody fired another shot from his pistol into the fallen man to be certain. Then he heard a rapid firing of bullets, though it was not a sound of many men firing at once. He had seen the Gatling guns and the damage and loss of life they caused. But he had never been on the other end of one, and now he staggered and held his ears in fear. The building was ripped apart like paper caught on fire. The structure moaned, and the upper half collapsed, spraying dust and debris into the air. Jody used the pluming cloud as an opportunity to run to the end of the adjacent building. He peeked around the corner and saw the rapid-fire death machine atop a wagon. It was being loaded and preparing to fire once again. Across a wide open space was the largest building of the town. On its roof were three more rifles. There was no returning the way Jody came. He would be gunned down before he made six yards. The gun was still being reloaded, and he seized his opportunity while he could. He aimed his rifle around the corner and pulled the trigger. Click! He was out in his rifle. Damn! He called. The Gatling began firing again, and Jody ran for it. He danced around doing his best to avoid catching hot lead, all the while blindly firing his revolver at the men on the roof to cover his advance. 
Dirt sprayed into his eyes, and down into his shirt, and his boots clomped against hot earth. By a miracle, he managed to dive through one of the basement windows of the main building with a crash. He looked up to find a stash of munitions and rifles, and he quickly grabbed and readied one, loading it with ease. He primed it and rushed back to the window. With a clear line of sight on the men manning the gatling, he picked them off with ease. Jody then made his way up a floor and entered into a saloon. His heart raced, and much of the firefight that came next went by in a blur. Jody Black ran from window to window, finding his targets and picking them off. The desperado was in his element, and the soldiers in the confusion fell one by one to his rifle. Fifteen men in all he took down on his own, though Jody had not forgotten the three rifles on the roof and he checked his ammunition once again as the men above could be heard making their way downstairs. He did not have enough to take on three men, and he would be cut off before he could resupply himself in the basement. The sweating man ran with smoking rifle barrel out the front door. The main road was quiet. Thinking on his feet, Jody sprinted to the death weapon now idle in the middle of the courtyard. As he fired the weapon, it obliterated the roof of the building, making it collapse downwards into splintered wood. From inside came the smothered screams of the remaining soldiers, and the fight met its end. The smoke from the barrels made Jody cough, and his ears were ringing. As far as he could make out, he had made it. His thirst came back to him, and he ran back into what remained of the saloon. He trashed the bar cabinets and searched for any sort of tap or bucket, anything. Then he ran back to the basement, and to his surprise found not only barrels of what he could only assume contained water. He reckoned he must have missed it while his mind was on the firefight. Though as he approached the barrels filled with salvation, he paused when he saw a large luggage box at the center of them all. It was tucked away neatly against the brick wall, the box was rather large, around two and a half foot by three, according to the naked eye. The lid was open, and Jody could make out rows of metal bricks organized neatly within. They were covered in cobwebs and dust, making them near unrecognizable. He approached the box and knelt down before it. He blew on them and wiped away the grime with his hand. The gold shone seductively in the dim, gray light. The desperado breathed heavy, his eyes widening. He reached in and pulled a brick out, admiring it as it called his name in the back of his mind. There was enough there to satisfy the needs of himself and his grandchildren, were he ever to have any. He thought for a moment about how he would carry it with him, but his shoulders sagged, and he sighed. Something felt wrong, about the gold. Before he could contemplate further, there was a click of a rifle behind him. Sorry, amigo. You challenged this land and it gave you a test. And you failed. Mateo's voice spoke from behind him. I told you I wasn't here for the gold, kid. Jody spoke without turning around. And I ain't gonna die like some kind of beggar dog with no pride or sense of decency. I have come this far in this life without this gold, and I don't need it. I have never needed it, and I will never need it. He gripped the pistol in his hand, ready for this last duel. He reached over and placed his free hand in one of the barrel lids and scooped some water to his lips. Then Jody Black's life instinct kicked in. He spun around, firing a single shot towards his attacker. Though when he turned, there was no mortal thing there. The freshly smoking bullet hole in the stone wall was encircled by dried, black blood. Below it was a skeleton in an officer's uniform. Jody stood quietly. He was cold, colder than the darkest night of the deserts. It took him a few moments to return to reality, and he felt the dirt and sweat and toil come back to him. He quenched his palate, and he washed his face and his hands. He took only what he needed from the barrels, 
and then he left quietly. The box, filled with gold, watched him longingly as he left without lifting a single brick. When he stepped outside, the air refreshed him. His eyes fixed upon the two men on the wagon that held the gatling. It shook him to see that they had not recently been killed in a shootout, but were white skeletons in piles among scraps of military uniforms. Taking a closer look at the skeletons, he confirmed what his mind was denying, but what his eyes were seeing, and he knew that it would take more than a few minutes for a body to decay. There was nothing to say or do, and so he simply walked away quietly, his shoulders hung low, looking as a man defeated after a long day's work. He returned to Mateo's trench on the side of the hill. Inside were the shreds of the young man's clothing, hugging a broken bundle of bones. The scraps shimmied gently as the wind caught them in its gentle whips. Mateo's pale skull was half buried in red earth, and it stared blankly at the wall of the trench. Jody sat, dangling his legs along the ends of the trench, and contemplated for many minutes. His confusion and thoughts were interrupted by the sound of panting. He turned to see the wolf had returned. A golden bar shone brightly between its sharp teeth. The desperado stared, unknowing of many things. And after a lifetime of locking eyes with his companion, he looked back to Mateo. Then, Jody Black wept.